Now, President Barack Obama has delivered a much anticipated address from the Oval Office. In the wake of the deadliest terrorist attack since 9 11. Saeed Farouk and his wife, Tashfeen Malik. Wanted to report it, but she said I didn't, she didn't want to profile. <laughs> The era of political correctness is over. That's a bit of a trailer from the film How to Kill 14 People Without Saying a Word. It is a controversial political documentary from award-winning filmmaker Nick Stubhauser, a Lorrainite, who is bringing it back home to the Lorraine Palace uh, on Friday at 7.30. Nick, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, gentlemen. How are you? All right, let's uh, get into this film, How to Kill 14 People Without Saying a Word. Quite a provocative title. Uh, talk a bit about uh, your putting this documentary together, and, and what's the point for it? Sure. Well, the title refers to the 14 innocent people that were killed on December 2nd, 2015 in San Bernardino, California, by two Islamic terrorists. And the without saying a word part has to do with the fact that their neighbors were suspicious, but they were too afraid to talk about it. And if they had overcome this fear, they could have prevented this attack because there were many, many signs leading up to it. And so the film really delves into why were the neighbors afraid? And we discover that the answer to that question is actually the root cause of a lot of the political uh, divide that we see in our country today. When did this story really become a known i mean it was a, a news story you were in high school i think at the time right if i'm not mistaken from your age or yes sir so, yeah i would have been i think a, a sophomore or a junior in high school when the san bernardino attack happened so when did you decide to look back at that and use that as sort of the launching pad for this whole uh, documentary actually that same year because i was uh in forensics in high school and i was delivering a speech about political correctness and taking that speech into competitions uh, around Michigan, and uh, that's what inspired this documentary was the speech that I had originally uh, written. So I had that uh, familiarity with that story for a long time, and then fast forward to 2017 when I'm on Spro Plaza at UC Berkeley and I'm watching the destruction of this campus in the name of supposed anti-fascism, and, and I began to draw the connection. Nick, tell us a little bit about your movie-making history in that you are a relatively young gentleman. How did you decide that this was something you wanted to do? Well, I've been making movies probably since I was seven or eight with just a little point-and-shoot camera back in, you know, Windows Movie Maker. So I, I've always had a true passion for filmmaking, and, and I'm not even really a documentary filmmaker. I'm more of a narrative filmmaker, but... Uh, as I mentioned, about halfway through my year at the Motion Picture Institute, uh, which was the trade school that I went to for film outside of high school, uh, I traveled to UC Berkeley and experienced these riots. And it inspired me to use my abilities as a filmmaker to create uh, a documentary so that I could tell the story and explain to you America and to people that are engaging in violence that look conversation is a, is a better way to go if we want to help people if we really want to solve these problems. Nick have you uh, screened this movie any place or will be, this be the initial showing? This will be the second showing. The first showing uh, was at the historic Howell Theater in, uh, in Michigan and the second showing is going to be here at the, the palace this Friday. Sometimes when people make documentaries, people watch and they sort of fall to the left, they fall to the right, there can be a divide. Uh, what do you expect from your movie? In terms of where it falls or, or where people respond to it? Yeah, what do you hope people will take away from it? Well, that's, that's a good question, and I have a, an answer that I've been thinking about for a while, because I think... At first blush, people are going to watch it, and, I mean, actually, people don't even need to watch it, and they already call me a white supremacist. They say that I'm a Nazi or a fascist. And so I think at first blush, people will think that this is a right-leaning film. But if you truly investigate it, it's not. It's an American film. It's not right versus left. It's truly about totalitarianism versus democracy. It's about 
um, socialism and communism versus traditional American values. So I suppose if, if, if people want to look at it from right versus left, yeah, it'll make sense that it does lean right, but it, it's actually leaning toward traditional American values. Who are some of the people you reached out to or went to seek their opinion on this topic? Yeah, so the the people in the film, I reached out to a lot, and uh, I got a decent amount. I have 11 interviewees in the film, and we have Cenk Uger from the Young Turks Network, uh, which is a very popular YouTube channel as well as syndicated on Sirius XM. Uh, Cenk le- leans pretty left. Uh, We have Dr. Philip Zimbardo, who is the architect of the Stanford Prison Experiment. Um, We have Cassie J., the director of The Red Pill, Gavin McInnes from CRTV and and YouTube. Um, Lots of individuals. And then there's some more personal interviews in there uh, from on-the-street type things that that people really start to share their opinions as Americans as opposed to conservative or or liberal pundits. You kind of get an inspiration from an event events taking place while you're making this film that you were able to add into this or kind of support maybe the narrative? Yeah, unfortunately, they, they continued to happen. And as we just saw, that you know, there's been two mass shootings in the last month. And it, it's just tragic that it continues to happen. And what's even more tragic is that a lot of them are similar in structure to what happened in San Bernardino. But I do add in uh, the Bataclan shooting that happened in uh, in France, the Charlie Hebdo attack, as well as the Parkland shooting, because I, I do believe that they are all rooted in the same fundamental fear of speech and suppression of speech. Part of the film also has to do with not only the, the what's being spoken, but sort of the, the soundtrack, as it were, and even with that level. Talk a little bit about the music putting into this, sort of the attitude which kind of propels the film. Well, I, I had the opportunity to work with a, a dear friend of mine, Patrick Gauthier. He goes by the compo- composition name Lighting Nights, and this guy is, is just wildly talented. And we worked on uh, the score for months and months, and I would send him some clips from the film, and he would come back and, and send me a song or two, and eventually uh, it came down to it where I would send him the whole film, and he sent me back an entire score with, with individual songs that were really uh, touching on the heart of what it means in each one of these scenes, whether it had to do with um, how the audience felt, whether it had to do with what the the person in the film exactly was experiencing. And so if people go on Spotify right now and just search the title of the movie, they'll, they'll find the soundtrack by, by lighting nights. And I, I highly recommend it because that's one of the parts of the film that's been getting the most compliments is actually the the soundtrack. Nick, I know your focus is on this film, How to Kill 14 People Without Saying a Word, but do you have anything else in the works, any other projects you're looking forward to? I do, yeah. So I'm actually in pre-production on a a relatively under-wraps documentary at the moment. But uh, So politics is downstream from culture, but culture is downstream from religion. So my next film is actually going to be an investigation, a personal investigation into religion. You mentioned it's sort of a narrative style. How much do you insert yourself into a movie, uh, into this the docu- this film like that? What's your style for that? So I barely insert myself at all. You might hear my voice in the background asking a question, uh, but beyond that, I'm not in the film because... I didn't want to make this about me and my opinion. I wanted to craft a narrative, craft a story. Um, and I, I think that's what, how I would describe my uh, insertion of myself into the film is really I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to explain something that's happening. And so I went out and I documented and then I, you know, I brought it back and I packaged it in a way that people are familiar with watching movies. It's um, not, I wouldn't say it's your traditional documentary style just because at heart I am a narrative filmmaker but it's all true events it's all data and and uh, stories of the real world when you're putting something like this together you get steeped into it are you able to take a deep breath and step back a little bit and sort of enjoy stop and smell the roses and realize life I mean sometimes if you're dealing with a lot of you know death and anger how do you kind of keep yourself level yeah, you do have to step away from it. Fortunately, filmmaking uh, is a lot of not filmmaking most of the time. So 
So uh, most of the time you spend making a movie is spent not actually doing it because you, you're either waiting on a phone call or an email or a confirmation or a flight or something from somebody. And so uh, you do have to step away from it and you don't want to become numb to the the horror that you're seeing every day. You know, every time I would edit this film and I would open it up and you would hear about the San Bernardino attack, that should still hit you as hard on play 450 as it did on play one or when you read the story online. So you do have to step away. And I think the best way to do that is to just go out and hang out with friends. I, I have a buddy that I, I pretty much saw every single week to just get away from the film and, and out into the world and just relax a little bit. Well, now that the film is out, how to kill 14 people without saying a word. I mean, the title people sort of have an idea what maybe to expect, or maybe it surprised them when they come in to see it again, it'll be shown at the Lorraine palace Friday at seven 30. Uh, people need to get uh, tickets. How do they do? They just get to the, the box office or yeah so they, they can either get them online right now or tomorrow at 7 30 p.m i'm sorry actually 6 30 is when doors open so they'll want to get there at 6 30 if they want to grab tickets tomorrow at the lorraine palace theater now are you uh planning to have any kind of uh introduction or post-film discussion or anything like that uh involved both with this? yeah yes indeed both i'm going to be addressing the audience beforehand with a brief 10 minute uh speech that I've, I've put together that sort of annexes the film and then I'll be available in the lobby for a question and answer and you know meet and greet just to talk about the film in case anyone has any questions or disagreements with me they can talk to me in person did if you told your family here's I'm making a film called how to kill 14 people without saying a <laughs> word I mean what kind of dinner table discussion is that well that actually wasn't the first title uh, that that was something that sort of came out of the whole production process. I was working with a gentleman out of California named Greg Bennett. And the original title was Unspeakables because, you know, we were talking about freedom of speech and everything. And, and I was talking to a producer friend of mine. And she said, that sounds like homework. That sounds boring. You need something that's more exciting. And so he and I were just on the phone for two and a half hours talking about the structure of the film and whatnot and, and how to really engage encapsulate what it meant uh, in, in, in a catchy title. And so that's sort of what we came up with. But yeah, you'll watch people as I say the title because it's so darn long. And I say the first part of it, their eyes get really wide. And then I say the second part of it and they just become a little bit more curious. So yeah, it's kind of tamper. I mean, that's almost like a horrifying Google search, if you ask me, when you type <laughs> how to kill, and then you're like, there's all these other things. Saying, well, who would us be searching these other things? But I mean, in a, in a sense, it sort of shows maybe the mind of somebody even who, who who would get you know be involved in something like that. So it exactly. does. It, I mean, in a sense, it does. It's sort of in your face a little bit, somewhat like the music as well. But people can find out more about it and see it at the Lorraine Palace uh, tomorrow night at seven thirty. Nick, we appreciate your time this morning and. Good luck with your next film and this project as well. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. Thanks.